Awesome. Should we get started? Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm so excited for this event today. We have an amazing panel of speakers and subject matter experts here um, to share a ton of great tips and advice um, to share with you all. Um, I'd love to kick things off um, with an introduction of everyone here. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, my name is Liz Bedore, and I lead our partnerships marketing team here at Sesame. Um, Sesame's mission is to make high quality healthcare accessible to everyone at affordable, clear prices. Um, Alice, do you wanna go ahead and go next? Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Alice Shepard. I'm a clinical psychologist based in Midtown Manhattan and I own a group therapy practice that focuses on the success of women. Hi, I'm Bethany Peterson. I'm a physical therapist. Uh, I own WellCore Physical Therapy in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, my specialty is in uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, uh, specifically treating uh, women postpartum. Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Bothwell and I'm the founder of Freelance Founders. We are a um, private community for creative and marketing freelancers and we're on a mission to help creatives charge their worth and maintain their creative freedom. Hi, I'm Michelle Perry and I'm the founder of the Feel Better Club. We're a safe space for artists, designers, and creatives to improve their mental health and create networks of comfort. And our main goal is to create healthy dialogue around mental health and help people get access to therapy. Great. Um, so why are we all here today? Um, so when Caroline, Michelle, and I got together originally to kind of talk about how our different brands could partner together and how we could work together and kind of what event would be the most valuable for helping people, um, talking more about overall well-being was kind of the theme that we kept coming back to. Um, and while we'll talk a lot about mental health today, we also wanted to acknowledge the connection between, to our physical wellness with our mental wellness, especially with everyone working so hard from home, kind of hunched over on our laptops, probably not showing um, that side of our wellness a ton of attention. Um, so what we wanted to do with this event is really bring those two types of therapy together, um, your mental and physical, to really give you the tools to look after your overall wellness. Um, so what we'll be discussing today, um, first, we're going to focus on tips for your mental and physical health that are really focused on COVID right now and kind of the situation and the environment that we're all kind of dealing with and struggling with right now. Um, next, we want to acknowledge that COVID is a temporary situation, but mental and physical uh, health takes ongoing work. So we want to focus on some general tips to keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with some tips for finding affordable health care, especially for therapy and physical therapy. Um, and since this is intended to be an open discussion, we'll pause for breaks between each of these sections and kind of open the floor for questions and discussion with our medical experts. Um, so feel free to chat in your questions as we go. We also had a bunch of submissions um, from registrations um, prior to the event. So we have those handy um, in case people are feeling a little shy and kind of we, we can kind of kickstart the conversation that way. Um, but our goal here is to really do our best to answer a lot of your questions and kind of have that open dialogue. Um, finally, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, we will be recording this session, so don't worry if you miss anything. We'll be sending that over um, so you can always reference it and have that as a resource. Um, if you'd like to share any of the conversation on social, feel free to use the tag um, hashtag Sesame, Sesame Group Therapy to share some of the tips and advice um, that we'll go over today. Um, and then finally, we will be donating three free therapy sessions through Sesame to an attendee today. We'll follow up after the event um, to let people know when that winner has been selected. Um, so just be sure to check your inboxes um, after the event. So thanks again for joining. Um, Carolyn, I'll kick it over to you to start us off. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, if for those of you who maybe are on our email list or follow us on Instagram or are members in our community, you re may remember that a few weeks back, we sent out a survey just kind of asking you how you've been doing and here's what the uh, results had to say. So 100% of us said that maintaining good mental health has been difficult or we feel like we're struggling here. Um, and 83% of us say that motivation and setting boundaries are big challenges right, that we're all facing right now. I think this is pretty obvious with everything going on with COVID and working from home. And then lastly, 33% of us are working with a mental health professional. 
So some of the top challenges for working from home during COVID include setting up productive workspaces, motivating ourselves, setting boundaries and avoiding overworking, staying focused, physically getting ready, communicating with coworkers if we're having a bad day and connect, connecting with coworkers. And I know this can be especially hard for those of us who work independently. Um, so finding you know, communities of other creatives or freelancers to connect with too. So as freelancers, you're used to things being up and down, but COVID has been a once in a lifetime set of circumstances. It's caused not only a medical health crisis, but also a mental health crisis. So there are a number of pressing concerns um, that everyone, all my clients are dealing with. Um, first and foremost is the loss of financial stability. Um, when I work with artists, many of them have second or third jobs, and they're reporting that even those second or third jobs are becoming less available or less frequent. Um, and that causes, of course, stress, um, not knowing you know, how they're going to make ends meet. And then also the loss of an in-person social network. As humans, we're social beings, and it's really important for us to have in-person time with our, with our loved ones, with our significant others, with friends and family. And I think prior to COVID, we might have taken that for granted, but certainly now it's become even more important that we maintain a social network. Um, and then just the sheer, um, um, you know, the sheer loss that we've all experienced, the 24-7 news cycle of frightening news reports, um, of just the overwhelming impact of the pandemic, that can be very stressful for all of us and impact our, our own well-being. Um, so whether we you know, have been impacted by illness ourselves or have friends or family members who might have contracted COVID, um, there's no way to avoid that this is a worldwide event um, that is impacting all of our well-being and our mental health. And the tremendous stress of COVID um, has led to, and I'm certainly seeing this in my practice, increased rates of depression, divorce, and a reliance on substance. Um, and so I think one, if anything good comes out of this horrible period in our human history, it is that, you know, the taboo about talking about mental health concerns and the stigma attached to it, I think is gone. Pretty much everybody is in therapy and it is okay to be in therapy. Um, and, and to even more than that, to check in on each other and to ask for people to reach out to us to check in on us. So there's a, a humanization, I feel like that's, that's happened. Oh, okay, so when I saw this New Yorker cover in December, I just had to laugh because here it is, you know, the image that we all like to portray, we're all guilty of it to one extent or another, that everything is fine and that we have everything under control. And then I think one of the privileges of being a therapist is that I get to see behind, you know, on the other side of the curtain or on the other side of the Zoom lens that people are really willing to share, at least with their therapists, how they're actually doing. And as you can see from this wonderful depiction, it's not that great. We're all kind of struggling in different ways. Um, and I think by prioritizing image at the expense of self-care and at the expense of just being maybe more vulnerable with others, it can prevent us from receiving the support and help that we actually need. So I wanted to include this. Thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of specific things that I am seeing working from home or just actually in this, in this time period, which I don't think any of us knew it was going to last this long. I think we're coming up to a full year. I don't think any of us could have imagined that, but here we are. And I want to really just, for all of us, you know, give encouragement and support because it, it is a lot. Um, I see that in the chat, yes. Um, 
So what I'm seeing in my practice is that there are on either ranges or either ends of the continuum. Either people are, you know, living with their life partner, their kids, their roommate, and all the times that they maybe would be able to go out and hang out with other people or go to work or whatever, all of that is gone. And so you're with those significant others now all of the time. And that is that has come like overwhelming to some of my clients. And then on the other end of the extreme is um, some people are feeling very alienated and isolated um, and unintentionally so. So like I have some clients who have a roommate, but that roommate now went to go back home to be with their family and they're left on their own for the first time. And being on your own, I think everyone can adjust to, but it's being on your own in a pandemic where you're really not able to socialize as much in person as we used to. Um, and that goes into the second point where it's hard to maintain natural, natural breaks. Um, we used to, again, take for granted the casual social interactions that we would have, just getting coffee, meeting people um, for drinks after work, commuting, um, even going to sit in a colleague's office. Um, and now all of that, you know, is temporarily gone, but we wanna make sure to add those back into our lives. And I think Bethany Peterson is gonna be talking about how to do that on a regular basis to support our health. Um, the one thing that we do tend to give ourselves permission for in terms of a, taking a break or having pleasure is food. And so, you know, there's this, um, there's this term going around COVID-15, which is kind of a spin on the freshman year of college gaining 15 pounds. Um, and of course, you know, you want to do whatever you can to manage to get through this, this incredible time in our lives. But eating has become the ubiquitous kind of source of comfort and also escape. What we want to talk about is like how we can make perhaps healthier choices. Okay, so in terms of tips for self-care, the most important one that I have identified is really increasing your social support. So even though we're not able to be in person as much, it's still very important that we reach out to friends and family, that we make time for this, um, whether that means, you know, doing a game night where you're you know, doing it virtually or watching a movie together with your best friend, but doing it virtually and talking the whole way through or meeting up with a friend to go for a run. Anything like that can really help lift your mood and just give you that kind of joy that you have when you're around others. Um, and make your day special. What I'm finding is that some of my clients say that the day is coming the night, the night coming the day, and it's like it's so amorphous and like wet, you know, what week am I in even? And you don't want to live like that. It's just going on for far too long to be able to just grit through it. Please reintroduce joy and pleasure and make your day special, whatever that might mean to you. So whether it means like getting tickets for a streaming online concert or doing something special for yourself during the day or with your kids, um, you know, having a dance party every day at six o'clock, anything to kind of bring back the element of fun. Um, and then the third point, you know, I feel like this is very particular to artists and freelancers is to maintain a, a flexible mindset. So I have some that I work with where, you know, it feels really difficult to consider making money in a different way, but I feel like COVID offers us the opportunity to take away that taboo and to maybe list your work on a website that you hadn't considered or consider going for training in another area. Anything that you can like had on the back burner of something that you might have wanted to try in terms of making money, now is the time to do it because just having that support of having additional income and that security will do a lot in terms of improving your, your well being. Um, the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about is the importance of creating your own treatment plan. So, one of the first things that I do as a therapist when I meet with a new client is we talk about the things that they're struggling with 
um, things that they want to work on, and then putting a specific plan into place to help them to meet those goals, whether they're interpersonal goals or career goals, relationship goals. Um, you know, and this is something that you can do to a large extent for yourself. You want to make the most of this time. So if there have been things that you've always wanted to do but never had the time to do, like this is an ideal opportunity to work on to work on those goals. Um, but certainly, in my own opinion, there's nothing quite as, as great as being in therapy. Um, and if you're noticing that that maybe you need a little bit more help, like the affirmations that you're saying aren't quite enough to help you get through the haze of depression, um, you wanna reach out and meet with a mental health provider. So if you notice that your lows are getting too low, and for me as a psychologist, the warning signals are, um, if you're struggling with feelings of hopelessness, if you're struggling with feelings of helplessness, and if you're struggling with feelings of worthlessness, those are really red signals that you should please reach out and connect with a mental health provider. Bethany. Hi, okay, so I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about working from home and how to set up a safe and effective work environment. Um, so a lot of you said that it's hard to set up a place that feels, um, feels good to you and feels, um, productive and so I can kind of help with how to set up your desk ergonomically and that also helps with the mental um, health side of things too. So I'm going to just move my computer over here. Um, <clears throat> so I have kind of a, sorry, okay I think you can see this now but I kind of have this set up here. Um, I have a blanket on my um, kitchen chair here because it's a little hard. So, and this kind of raises the chair up a little bit. So I have this, this kind of raises me up, it's nice and comfortable. And then my computer is up on these two boxes here. These are just boxes I found around my house. They're just about, I don't know, six inches tall. And so that my computer can sit up here and that puts my computer at, a, at eye level. The top of my screen is at my eye level and then a Bluetooth keyboard would be great down here with a Bluetooth mouse would be awesome. And then I don't have any armrests on this chair, but ideally my um, arms would be at about 90 degrees. My elbows would be at about 90 degrees. It'd be a little bit closer. If you don't have armrests on your chair, you can use a pillow and just place it in front of you. And that's nice and comfortable, um, just like that. The other option you have if you're a little shorter than me, uh, you can put just a pillow behind your back. And then um, I just have a yoga block, but you can use um, any sort of book or something that's about that big. I hope you guys can see this okay. And then um, that just kind of sets me up here and then my pillow would be in front. So those are just kind of some ways, different ways to set up your space. Could you guys see that okay? Okay, um, so that's kind of some creative ways to set up just a kitchen chair. Um, so just kind of get creative with your um, with your setup. Ideally, we would all have a perfect office chair and a standing desk and all the things, but that's not reality. So especially when you are unexpectedly having to work from home. So um, the other thing that I like to think about with posture is not trying to force yourself to sit in a certain specific and perfect posture all day. That's not realistic. Um, so we just wanna set it up so that we're at a ready position. So I don't know if you, any of you played sports as kids, but um, there's kind of a ready position in basketball or tennis or anything where you're kind of in a squat position and you're ready to go in any direction. And that's kind of what we wanna think about um, when we, are setting up our desk is we want everything to be set up so that we are ready to um, to answer the phone or move our mouse, type, whatever we need to do, um, our water bottles within reach. So we're not putting extra strain on our shoulders, on our neck, on our lower back. Um, and then we can shift and change and move positions and go sit on the couch for a little bit, but we can always come back to that ready position. We can go to the next slide. Sorry. 
Um, okay, now we get to move a little bit. <laughs> um, so there's some, but before we stretch, sorry, I forgot that I added this before. Um, before we stretch, we're gonna go over some important guidelines, um, kind of with activity and what it looks like um, working from home. So we wanna change our position or just our work activity at least once an hour. And that just kind of helps um, shift our mindset and keep us engaged and kind of just gets us moving a little bit. So if you can just, if you're sitting in that, in a really nice, comfortable, propped position for about an hour, just kind of shift, cross your legs, uncross your legs, go get a drink of water, um, change, change positions, change work activities at least once an hour. Um, outside of our workday, um, I like to tell people to exercise for about 30 minutes, three times a week. It seems really doable three times a week. The American Heart Association is recommending 150 minutes of moderate act intensity activity during the week, which would be 30 minutes five times a week. But that can also mean just cleaning the house, chasing your kids around, um, anything, those types of things. But I think mental health wise and just for our physical health too, separating out, I'm gonna focus on me and myself and give myself three time, three days a week where I'm focusing on exercise really kind of helps shift our mindset um, and make it feel important. And that makes us feel like we're doing something for ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, the other recommendation I have is to stretch and stand about every 15 to 30 minutes. Um, that just kind of helps, again, shift your mindset, make sure your joints are still moving. <laughs> um, and I know when I'm working at the computer, um, I haven't done that in a long time, but I've been doing it more so this year. And it um, definitely, I notice every, about every 30 minutes, I need to stand up or do some, do some shoulder rolls. So go on a short walk around your house. Don't feel silly. Walk up and down your hallway five times. Walk up and down your stairs a few times. Um, do a lap. Check what the neighbors are doing. <laughs> um, just kind of helps give you, get out of your um, normal routine. <clears throat> Okay, now we get to go through the stretches. So there's going to be a little video playing and it has most of the stretches on there, but I'll kind of walk through them too. Feel free to do them along with me. Um, so the first one is um, just neck stretches. You can static hold these. So the first one is just kind of bringing one ear to your shoulder and pulling this shoulder down and just holding for about 30 seconds. And then you can look towards your armpit, check and see if you showered today hold for 30 seconds, and then you're gonna look up, kind of pressing down on your clavicle, pulling back, and that stretches the front of your neck for about 30 seconds, and you do that on both sides. Just like that. So that kind of gets the, those really nice <laughs> muscles all around here. So that's a static hold. The neck rolls are next, so you just kind of roll a few times and then go the other direction. Switching directions is a little hard sometimes. Okay, and then shoulder rolls, go backwards about 10 times, and then forwards. And then the next one is thoracic rotation. So this really, neck pain and low back pain, we oftentimes see that the mid back is really tight and immobile. So this one is really helpful. I give this to almost all my patients, but you're rotating open and back. So it kind of looks like that and my arms are just in front of me or down on my knees, but you can say be in front. It's kind of like a rainbow. You're making a rainbow with your opposite arm. You do about 10 on each side. The next one is a chest stretch. So this is kind of a double whammy here. You're opening the chest and then strengthening your back muscles at the same time. So your kind of arms are like this, and then you're opening and squeezing this muscle, your muscles back here. Like you've got a pencil in between your shoulder blades and you're just gonna squeeze that. Um, and then chin tuck is next. So you're gonna make an L with your fingers. Thumb goes on your chest and finger goes on your chin. And you're just gonna bring your chin straight back. Kind of look like a chicken. <laughs> I'm from Kansas, so that <laughs> is a good analogy for me, but um, you'll remember that one. The piriformis stretch is next. This one is a little bit hard to see, but you're gonna make a figure four position. It'll show up on the video here in a minute, but you're going to make a figure four position. So your ankle, your right ankle would be on top of your left knee. And then you're going to push down on your right knee. 
So you're kind of stretching your um, hips there. So that one right there. And then hamstring stretch, you're just gonna face one direction, kick one leg out straight, the other knee is bent, and then you just lean forward. I'm glad some of you are doing this. <laughs> Keep going, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, so that's that hamstring stretch. You don't need to stand up and, and go straight down. You can just actually do it while you're seated, which is really nice. Just make sure you're hinging at your hips and not arching at your back. The last one is pelvic tilts. Um, so you're just kind of rocking forward and back. I mean, I can stand up and do this one. So you just kind of rock forward and back, but you're sitting. And that one's on the video too. And it looks like they'll send that video out for you as well. So you can just go through those about, you don't have to do all of them. You can do the neck stretches and the chest stretch, you know, after 15 minutes and then the next 15 minutes, choose another two exercises. That seems to kind of break up the day a little bit. And then maybe by the end of the day, you'll make it through all the stretches. Um, but those are some good mobility moves, keeps your, kind of wakes your brain up a little bit. I know I feel a little bit better after that, so. Good, okay, and I think we can go. I don't think I have another slide. Okay, this is open discussion, perfect. Awesome, and thank you, Bethany and Alice. This was so helpful, and uh, we went over some of these exercises yesterday, and they definitely already have been helping me. Um, so this is awesome. And then we wanted just to take a minute here to stop and see if anybody has any questions um, before we kind of continue on. Uh, and talk more specifically about artists and uh, different ways that we can cope there as well. Um, we did have a couple of people submit questions, so I can start with those and people can drop in the chat if they have anything else. Um, but this might be actually a really helpful one to hear input on um, Alice, and it's really just how should you deal with the instability of freelancing. It feels like sometimes if I get one thing wrong, my client may fire me and that gets really taxing mentally. Yeah, I think that is something that um, is a tremendous concern because there, there aren't as many job opportunities as they were before. And at the same time, you really can't drive yourself crazy thinking that if I do one wrong thing, then, then that's it. I think this brings up a really good question about where do we get our sense of security from? Is it from outside external sources or can we create rituals and patterns in our lives and recognize the connections that we have not only with ourselves but with important others to give us our sense of security? It sounds like the best you can do is what you're doing, which is um, being aware and wanting to do the best you can at work. Um, but, but I really wouldn't make it into, if you do just one wrong thing, um, then, then that's it. Because you're much bigger than your work life. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I know for me, it's been helpful during this time just to have a group of other people going through the same thing. I know in our Slack channel, we have an advice channel that's going on a lot. And it's just helpful to know other people are going through the same things, which is really great too. Um, the second question, actually, I think both Bethany and Alice may be able to provide good insight on, but it's just kind of about work-life balance and how can you shut off and take some productive rest time at the end of the day or at the end of the week? Yeah, I, I'm, Bethany, do you want to go first? Or? Sure, I can go first. Um, I mean, I think personally, uh, exercise is a great way to kind of break up your day um, and kind of I mean, luckily we're coming up on spring, having some warmer days so we can get outside a little bit more, which helps a lot. But um, even like I said, just taking laps in your hallway a little bit um, sounds silly, but it really does kind of get you out of that um, just work mindset, listen to a song you like and kind of make some laps up and down your hallway. Um, even, um, yeah, just, I think, anything you can do to kind of break up the monotony of, of work. And I think a lot of us are working longer hours because we're at home. Um, we're not going somewhere and then coming home um, and kind of having a break there. So kind of making your own commute is what I've been talking to um, some clients about is just, you know, walk up and down your hallway 10 times on your way to the office, get your coffee, walk with your coffee, um, listen to some music and pretend it's your commute and then do the same thing at the end of the day and just kind of break up 
some time and, and scheduling time with yourself um, to either exercise or read or doing things like that. I found has worked um, for some of my clients, but um, I'm sure Alice has some, some other ideas as well. I really love those suggestions. It's fantastic. Um, I think it's essential that you create time and that you turn work off um, because it really helps to recharge you and inspire you. And you know that you get your best ideas when you're thinking about other things. So I'm all for, you know, having limits for yourself. So if, if you don't want to work past a certain hour, then that is your rule. Or if you want to have your time first thing in the morning just for yourself, you want to set up your schedule so that it fits your own needs and your own personal like biorhythms and personality. You want to put yourself first and certainly by taking breaks will lead to greater creativity and relaxation and enjoyment. Yeah, awesome. I agree with that. I've had to tell some of my clients that I have set working hours now. Um, I've always worked from home, but now really feeling the impact of everybody else working from home and working long hours. So um, I think that's an important thing that freelancers can do as well. Awesome. And it doesn't look like there's any additional questions. So maybe we can just kind of uh, keep moving along and feel free to chat because we'll have some time at the end as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that a lot of us, despite COVID, we're dealing with these mental health issues beforehand. So we're gonna go back to the survey that we sent out earlier this month and answer a question that we found is really interesting. So we asked you guys, which of the following do you generally find challenging about working as a freelancer or artist when it comes to your mental health? And 75% of you said confidence, 58% comparing myself to others, 58 said, trying your tying your services as a value of your self-worth. 50% said long hours, unpredictable workloads. 50% said down on myself when I don't get a job or a client. And 42% said pressure to always be creating. So I think these are all things that we all can relate to and struggle with, especially now from working from home. And so Alice is gonna help us for figure out some coping mechanisms for these Okay, sure. So thankfully, COVID will have an endpoint, but our stress and the importance of focusing on well being will continue. Um, so, in terms of a few pieces of advice, I, I think that is a, a common problem where we um, where we struggle at times with confidence. And one way of achieving it is to continue to work on your, your goals, which is your self-developed treatment plan. It feels so great when you have something in mind and you have a system in place that you turn your attention to and put time and effort towards on a daily basis. It can't help but feel good. And then you enter into that positive feedback loop. And even though there are small steps, it gets easier and easier or you're getting closer and closer to that goal and it does give like a real boost to your confidence. Um, so that's the first thing that I would recommend for those of you who might be struggling in that way. Um, and the second thing is um, how to combat comparison. I feel like as people, our eyes are going outward. So we're always focused on what other people are doing. And then you add in social media. And it's everywhere that we're inundated with how great everyone else's lives certainly seem to be, right? Um, but just going back to that New Yorker cartoon and, and the cover, you can see that really not everyone's life is as great as they're making it out to be. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're one of those people that's constantly scrolling through Insta and like uh, going comparing yourself in, in those ways. Um, when I work with my clients, I actually have this thing that I say where I'm like, well, jealousy, you know, it, it's not the worst thing. There's some positive things about being jealous or being envious because it is a sharp awareness that there is something that you're wanting in your life. 
Um, and we know that jealousy and envy can be painful, but it's also information. And so once you've been able to identify that there's something that you're really wanting, then it really helps to figure out the steps to take, not necessarily to get somebody else's life, because in, in reality, we don't really want somebody else's life. What we want is our best, our best life. Um, and so if we figure out what it is, whether it's a relationship, or a certain level of income, when we start taking just incremental steps in that direction, the comparison or the tendency to compare kind of melts away. Um, so here I talk about combating comparison and low self-worth by prioritizing self-care, well-being, and personal development. There are a ton of classes, online classes and communities uh, where you can connect with others who are also working on these things. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is the importance of securing a consistent work schedule and protecting your creative process. So, um, and I think I mentioned this, this earlier, but you want to be flexible with the ways in which you consider earning an income. All income is good income. So it doesn't have to be just that you're able to get a certain price for a painting or a photo or a piece of writing. Um, all sources of income will help to lead you to a higher lifestyle, more security, et cetera. And I do feel like COVID and the pandemic and everything that's come with it has offered us the um, opportunity to be more flexible, more open, with the ways in which we're willing to earn, earn money. Um, and then this other point of securing a consistent work schedule, you really wanna prioritize yourself. And I know artists have their own ways of working and everyone is an individual and different. Um, some people do their best work you know, in the morning and they wanna get a certain amount of pages in before they start with the rest of the day. Other people, it, it really is, it comes with inspiration and they just want to be able to dive in for long periods of time. So it's really up to you, but I would prioritize that as you're setting your work schedule. So if you want to say, get 25 hours in during the week of working on your own creative process, then just budget that in from the beginning. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, just recommendations for general movement. Um, there's a lot of actually office related injuries um, that are typically due to sitting or standing for too long with poor posture. Um, so like I talked about before, it's not necessarily that you need to be in this perfect position at all times, otherwise you're gonna have pain, but just that you continue to move. Um, and if we're in a position that's um, a poor position for eight hours, that's gonna cause us pain. So the more you can kind of shift your weight, and I, I tell people to look at their toddlers a lot. If you can even just, even if you don't have a toddler, just imagine a toddler, they're constantly moving. And rarely do toddlers, um, normal healthy toddlers have pain because they're just constantly figuring something out and moving and changing their position. Um, so we don't have to be that active, but um, we can just just kind of think about shifting your weight. Um, if you always cross your right leg over your left, try doing the opposite. Um, if you've been sitting on the couch for an hour, try and go sit on an exercise ball um, for an hour, things like that. So that will help. Um, that's my recommendation for everyone that helps the most. And then like we already talked about getting that kind of ready position um, that you can always go back to if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, my neck is bothering me. Um, so low back pain, neck and shoulder pain, decreased circulation, repetitive use injuries to the wrists and hands, and then staring at a screen too long. Um, these are all, I'm sure you guys are all like nodding your heads like, yep, I can see how all of those happen. Um, <clears throat> so just being aware that those things can happen and that sitting is um, the new smoking is what they are saying. So um, sitting disease is really common. Um, and even just not just sitting, but standing, um, if you stand for work too, that can, um, standing is better, but still just think about those 
we're, we're in one position and we're not moving around a lot. So um, think about those types of things. And then if you're having consistent pain, just not being afraid to go see a physical therapist. Um, I think a lot of times during COVID too, people have put off their health uh, problems because they're, they don't think that they're important enough or um, they don't think that because there's people with COVID or that they're scared to go into a, um, a healthcare facility. So I know for me, I work alone and um, so by myself and it's a really clean and safe environment. So trying to find somewhere that fits, fits you if you're um, worried about COVID. Um, and now that a lot of healthcare workers, including myself, have had the vaccine, that kind of helps too. Um, so just not waiting also to get to get help with uh, with pain. Um, but general movement will help a lot with just neck with stiffness, which I feel like a lot of us have is just low back stiffness or neck stiffness. Um, just moving um, helps a lot of those things. So but if you're having continued pain, um, please go see someone. So that's uh, that's basically my recommendations. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Bethany. I definitely feel like I need to move around a lot more throughout the day. I'm sitting all day long. Um, all right, so we have an open discussion session and if anybody has any questions, please enter them into the chat. And for the time being, we have a sheet with all the questions you guys entered in for the survey. And I felt that this one was really important. So I wanted to ask Alice, um, what are tips for those who have a loved one who suffers from PTSD, bipolar disorder, anxiety, or depression? What are things we can do to help them when they're upset? Sure. So um, thank you for asking that question. I feel like, again, one of the positives to come out of this time period is the people's willingness to be open and talking about not only their own mental health struggles, but the mental health struggles with their families and friends. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is the importance of self-care and seeking support for the caregiver. So there's the National Association of Mental Illness, NAMI, I can put it in the chat, um, that is a wonderful source of support. Um, they offer groups um, that caregivers can attend. Um, and it's really helpful to know that you're not alone with having um, a loved one who struggles with um, mental health concerns. And then in terms of what you can do, I mean, there's really such a range. The, the things, the concerns that you mentioned are fairly, are fairly serious. And so I would say it would be really good for you to talk with a mental health professional so they can have more of a fuller understanding of, um, of the concerns that your loved one is facing. Okay, and is there like a certain way that you would kind of suggest that to a friend without it being, or a loved one without it coming off in the wrong way? Okay, sure. So what really my suggestion is for the caregiver, so the person who is the friend, mm -hmm. um, to go and get the support, but, um, and to go seek out a mental health professional for themselves as a caregiver. Because oftentimes people who have um, some of the more serious mental illness, PTSD, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, they're not able to recognize that they're struggling. And that's what makes it so difficult. And that's what becomes um, so, so, so tiring and exhausting for the for the person who's able to see that they're struggling. And so what I'm saying is for the person who's asking the question to get support for yourself as well. Okay, yes, that makes sense. And it helps them get help because it's already an overwhelming time for them. Okay, well, if there's any other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'd love to hear from you guys. It can range from anything, mental health or physical health. Okay, well, I can pull up another question from our Google Doc. Um, I think this one could be good for Bethany. Someone is asking, how do we 
integrate healthy habits and a balanced diet and sleep and exercise into our routines? Yeah, that's a tough question. I think we all um, struggle with that at, at times and in, um, you know, points of our lives, depending on how busy we are. I think my biggest recommendation to people is not to get so worried about being an A plus student, be a C plus student is what I tell my patients. Like, don't go, if you can't do it all, don't just be like, well, I guess I'll stay up till 2am watching TV and eat frozen pizza for every meal. Like, there's a middle ground. So um, you don't have to be perfect every single day. It's all about balance. So um, I think that's my biggest recommendation to people is just, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, especially when we are looking at social media and thinking that everyone else is doing this great job exercising all the time or eating healthy all the time. So there might be times in our lives when we're really, we do an exercise program and we're really consistent with exercising, but then maybe that means that we're up a little bit later um, finishing our work or um, we don't have time to cook dinner. So I think just recognizing that there's always a balance and just focusing on implementing one thing at a time can really help um, kind of get a routine going. So don't worry about doing everything um, at once. Is there a question that popped up? Yeah, I like that. I feel like I'm always trying to be an A plus student. I have to remind myself to calm down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> C plus. <done. laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, so I guess we kind of answered that question from um, one of our attendees. But if anybody else has anything, feel free to type them in. Yeah, I guess just the other thing I was going to say is just choose, um, like with posture and things, I, I tell people to choose one thing to implement at a time. So raise your computer height and give that a week and then try and implement one other thing. Um, so I don't know if that, if that helps too. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. There's other questions coming in, but should we answer them later or should we keep going? Not too sure. Um, let's let's go ahead and and um, and uh, answer these. Okay. So, how about um, any tips for how to process rejection in a healthy, non-self-destructive way? Maybe Alice, do you have anything on how to handle rejection? Okay, well, you know, nobody likes rejection. It's so painful. I mean, and I think just recognizing just our common human experience that it, it, it hurts and it's painful, um, but also that it doesn't mean the end of the world. And I think uh, what helps is trying for things and giving yourself encouragement that you did try for something. Um, and I feel like as a society, I wish we would talk about failure more, starting with our young kids, so that it doesn't become, you know, such a big deal. Really, you should be rewarded and reward yourself for having tried for something and to encourage yourself to keep doing it. Because what I found with the clients in my practice, you know, at the beginning, especially being an artist, you're facing a ton of rejection at times. But if you stay with it, you are are often likely to achieve success, but it is hard at the beginning to kind of to face that for sure. Yeah, you just gotta keep going and try again. Mm -hmm. Definitely tough. Um, and I think we have one more question. Uh, any tips for how to encourage a friend to go to therapy when they're resistant to the idea? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, this is very specific to what the friend is going through. I'll take the more extreme example. If you have a friend that is um, discussing suicidal ideation or anything like that, it's really important that you take it seriously and help them to get immediate help. Call 911, go with them to their nearest emergency room and stay with them until that they can be safe. Um, but for people who are not at that extreme, if you just have a friend who's like constantly dating the wrong kind of person or constantly in these underpaying jobs or constantly like, you know, it's kind of stuck and you, and you love them and you want them to move forward, I would say proceed 
very, very gently because it's always easier to see what somebody else is doing, you know, and to comment about what someone else is doing. Um, and so just keep that in mind. And, um, you know, you want to gently, you know, say that they don't have to struggle in the way that they might be struggling and that there are, there are options out there. And everybody is in therapy. Everybody has an executive coach or on some kind of app or something. We're all working towards, um, towards improvement. And, and so if they're open to it, that you as a friend are open to helping them find the right the right provider or the right path as well. Yeah, I love that. I think that's great advice. Thanks, Alice. Um, should we continue now with Sesame? Yeah, let's go to the next section. And then if we, I think we'll have a couple minutes at the end too to answer any, um, any final questions from everyone. So, um, so yeah, so um, thank you, Alice and Bethany, so much for your insights. Um, the final piece that we wanted to talk about here is actually accessing healthcare. Um, it's been really great for us to help uh, share Alice and Bethany's expertise here with everyone, but it's always not realistic to count on, you know, virtual events like this or kind of these types of opportunities to have um, your, your questions that are top of mind handled. So um, kind of in short, accessing healthcare can be hard. Um, so go, kind of going back to the survey um, that we had sent out to everyone, we asked kind of what were some of the biggest barriers that were top of mind for you all um, when accessing healthcare? And um, almost all of you said not understanding what was covered and what was not. Um, I think to add to like a layer of that, because I feel like there's kind of a spectrum of issues that kind of go into coverage. Um, we came across this tweet and I think that this is such a painful experience that all too often people run into, especially with therapy um, in that like your healthcare coverage is switched and a therapist that you've really clicked with and made a lot of progress with is no longer in network and no longer covered. So then you have to go find someone else. Um, so that's just a, 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 another barrier that kind of comes up after you've overcome all of these, um, all of these challenges that we've been discussing today. Um, high cost is another big area that is a big issue for people. Um, and then finally, surprising or confused bills. I think we're probably all um, have found ourselves in a situation in which we get an unexpected bill in the mail uh, for something that we thought was covered. Um, and that kind of ultimately always gives us pause, even when we're looking to seek care somewhere. Um, so I wanted to like, briefly talk to everyone a little bit about Sesame. Um, we are a direct-to-patient marketplace um, that really kind of hits on a lot of these problems that we all too often face. Um, we're a direct-to-patient marketplace um, where you can find quality providers offering affordable upfront pricing for in-person and virtual services. We have all types of care, all types of specialties on Sesame, um, including mental health and physical uh, mental health and physical therapy. But in addition, we have primary care, dermatology, dentistry, um, wide range of services. And actually, Allison, Allison, Bethany are two of the amazing doctors that we um, have on Sesame who have profiles with us. Um, and directed patient healthcare, I think, is like kind of a new term that people might not be super familiar with. Um, but I think a great way to kind of make it digestible for people is it's like direct to consumer, um, but for healthcare. So I think we're all very familiar. Um, Everlane, Casper, Warby Parker, these were kind of the brands that came out um, with this message that was like, hey, there's actually like a huge markup for a lot of things that, um, you know, that you're, you're buying. And when you bring this direct to consumer model in, it's actually just cutting out the middleman and passing those savings directly to you. Um, so we're essentially kind of taking that model into healthcare. So we cut out the middleman, pass that cost savings over to you. We have clear up from pricing, so no concern about surprise bills. Um, and we're completely outside of insurance, so you don't have to worry about any sort of network coverage, someone being out of network, um, or any sort of restrictions that come with that. Um, and it seems kind of so simple because, and like foreign, because it's in healthcare, but um, really it's as simple as it sounds. Um, the way that it like tactically works is you just find your doctor on Sesame, you select that doctor, you book them, and then you pay them um, the set price. So all the doctors on Sesame set their own prices. So you're really just paying that, that doctor directly for their service. Um, and we also wanted to end by providing a few additional resources for help. Um, Alice, I think that a lot of these came from you if you wanna to speak to them. 
Okay, sure. So the first one is substance abuse and mental health services administration. And that's for those of you who might be struggling with um, relying on um, alcohol or marijuana or anything to kind of self-medicate during this time that, and there's a range, right? It comes from just like doing it in a social way versus um, developing a dependence on it. But if you're worried about it, it's great to check in with a mental health provider and this is a resource line for you. Um, and then the second one is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. If you have a friend that is engaging in self-harm in any way, it's great to be able to offer them this as a resource or for yourself. If you're finding that you know, you're up one night and your lows are getting too low, this is a 24 hour hotline that you can reach out and talk with someone. But again, to always know that you can go to your nearest emergency room or contact 911 for help. Um, I wanted to also mention the American Group Psychotherapy Association. Group therapy is a really great way of being able to have affordable mental health care. Um, unlike individual sessions, which can run anywhere from $65 to in New York, over $300 per session. Group therapy um, you know, is a way of being a part of a support group. It's very impactful. And the sessions are more around $35 to, to $55. Um, and the American Group Psychotherapy Association is really wonderful. And they will help connect you with a group therapist. And then I also listed my own practice, which is Muriel Therapy Practice and we're based in New York. Thank you. And then my practice is well core physical therapy. I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so I and I specialize in in pelvic floor physical therapy, but I also see the general public and um, I also offer virtual wellness visits. Um, so if you're looking just for um, like exercise or nutrition tips, we can um, do that on a virtual basis. And um, I can give you just general um, recommendations uh, if that's something you're looking for. Great, and then as I mentioned, um, we'll be following up after this um, with the recipient for the uh, three free therapy sessions towards SME. So um, again, keep an eye out for um, at your inboxes and we'll be sending that by the end of the day. Um, so I know we're just at time, but if anyone has any final questions, um, otherwise I think it might be helpful to answer this one of any tips on how to process rejection um, in a healthy or non-destructive way. Oh, okay. So I think we touched on that before, just about the pain of rejection. I think really it's thinking about it differently to shift your perspective. Um, and to really encourage and congratulate yourself for trying things. It does hurt to be rejected, but it also means that you're willing to be vulnerable and put yourself out there. People who don't fail, you know, don't succeed. Great, and sorry, that was, that was my mistake. Um, Liz shared another question. Um, how can I quiet or manage feelings of being overwhelmed with job tasks in life and in general? Oh, I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Um, how can I quiet or manage feelings of being overwhelmed with job tasks and life in general? So I guess just kind of general overwhelming um, feelings, kind of how to manage those. That is a great question. I, I really think it is about putting yourself first um, and structuring your day again so that it's based around social connection, that it's based around joy, that it's based around self-care and rest. And I know that's not always easy because we have different commitments and different demands, but if you're not doing okay yourself, you really can't take care of other people and take care of the work. Um, and also for the creative process, we know that um, you know if you let yourself step away from it, inspiration is able to come in most cases. So I would say, you know, if you're starting to get overwhelmed, do what Bethany has said in terms of taking a break, go outside, connect with nature and with other people and just remind yourself of the larger world and, um, and hopefully that will help. Great. Um, and let's take this one final question from Liza. Um, how do you handle the anxiety of the uncertain income that comes with being a freelancer or artist? 
Yeah, I work with a number of artists. And I think what people have done in the past is, you know, they're working two or three jobs. I think what COVID has done is really even taken those supports kind of out of the way. So if you worked in a gallery, in addition to being a painter, now the gallery isn't as open as, as often. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier, you want to push back the boundaries of what you find allowable in terms of sources of income and to be creative. And so maybe you never thought of selling your artwork online or through Insta, or maybe you've always wondered what it would be like to, to teach or to tutor or to uh, do website stuff or to whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, now is the time to play with those things because if you're just narrowly focused of I can only make money this way, then I think it, you're gonna hit that friction and frustration. Um, well, I know we're a few minutes over. Um, I just want to thank everyone again for attending, all of our participants, um, everyone on our panel. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, we'll be sending some follow-up items after this. Um, but thank you again. I hope this was really helpful. I hope you enjoyed the content um, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>